Each Sunday, we begin with the land acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of this land. Wherever you are listening, please bring to mind the indigenous peoples of your place. Each Sunday, we begin with the land acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of this land. Wherever you are listening, please bring to mind the indigenous peoples of your place. There will be a moment of silence after the acknowledgement. We recognize and acknowledge that we gather today on indigenous land taken through coercion, deception, and violence. We acknowledge the continued displacement and oppression of Native people, and we honor their commitments to survival, identity, and the protection of our world. Thank you.
Good morning. The words for our chalice lighting this morning are from Bruce Southworth with the title, A Communion of Heart and Soul. For the gift of this day and for our spiritual community of nurture and compassion, we give thanks. And we light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. May our many sparks meet and merge in communion of heart and soul. Good morning. Our reading this morning <clears throat> is uh, written by the Reverend Julia Hamilton, a UU minister. Um, it's a poem that was published in the summer 2020 edition of the UUA Church Magazine. The title of the poem is A Blessing for Those in, in the Scrubs. You, the one in the scrubs, the one breathing in a mask meant for a moment, but kept all day guarding gloves like gold. You, the one who peels off your clothes like onion skin at the end of your shift, to keep your house safe from microscopic hitchhikers, to keep your home a sanctuary. You, essential one, caretaker of our community, self-isolating, sanity-doubting, hand-scrubbing, angry and hungry, giddy and tired, helpful and hopeful and scared, all in a whirl. This blessing is meant for you. It's a hard-won blessing, an awkward offering of our very real hearts, a tumbling gratitude that bursts from our balconies, scribbled in signs of thanks pressed against hospital windows. 
We are hoping you can hear us from our many separate rooms, calling down a blessing on your head, your hands, all of the alveoli in your lungs, where oxygen and pathogen might meet. We bless your stubborn faith in life, your willingness to walk toward trouble, your intolerance of unnecessary death, your impatience with our slow understanding. We bless your families who keep watch over your comings and goings and hold your humanity in safekeeping. We bless all of you, the whole of you, from the head surgeon to the brand new nurse, the night shift janitor and the laid off clinic staff. May you be safe. May you be well. May you be healed and be held as you heal and hold others. May you know that you are loved. This reflection is from Kathy Frizzell. For the past 15 years, Leon and I love spending almost five months in New Hampshire and Vermont every summer. But our similar plans for this summer changed abruptly because of the coronavirus. As much as we've missed being in beautiful, cooler New England with all our extended family and lifelong friends, we have discovered a beautiful surprise in our own backyard. We have lived in our current house for 13 years, having bought it from our very dear friends when they left town. They told us to do nothing to the little back garden off the deck, as it would take care of itself. We lucked out getting new neighbors who were master gardeners on both sides of us and beyond, including our UU neighbor, Sally Anderson. And we enjoy our views of their talented efforts. We felt sorry for them that they have us as neighbors as we are not gardeners at all. We are just happy if we have grass growing for the whole summer for them to look at. We would leave every May with emerging greenery in our little back garden and we would come back in October with nothing left in it but straggles competing with tall weeds. We've been embarrassed by what we thought was an eyesore, but knew it didn't make sense to invest in new plants as no one would be here to water over the hot summers. Imagine our delight to be here this summer to discover the ever emerging surprises in our own little backyard garden. These gorgeous flowers have been coming in waves all summer, each taking their own turn to bloom and hear our appreciative oohs and ahs. This is particularly poignant for us as the planter of this garden, our dear friend Andrea Colwell, died last summer. Her legacy garden is still thriving and taking care of itself and us, just as she had planned and promised. It has been so heartwarming to thank her almost every day for all the beautiful gifts she is still bringing to our lives for all these 40 years of our friendship. It's not all bad. I'm Sylvia McDermott. Every article I read in the newspapers currently is tragic, infuriating, disheartening, and stressful. I put down the papers, quite literally, in my flower beds covered with mulch or compost and pick up my shovel. For a few years, I've imagined creating native plant beds around our yard. This spring, while spending more time at home, I wanted to use my time well. With help from Tom and a neighborhood teen, I removed iris patches, rose bushes, and some of our lawn. I placed substantial orders with Prairie Nursery and ordered books about landscaping, learning about a topic that interests me and creating new gardens are marvelous antidotes to boredom and stress. This pandemic will probably continue longer than we hope, but it will subside. Trump's presidency has already continued too long, but it will end. As works in progress, my native plant beds are a visual reminder of those facts.
Planting native perennials doesn't provide instant gratification. Forbs and grasses require time to establish their roots. Next year, my gardens will look more colorful than this summer, and better still in two years. They manifest hope for a better future, for all to see. Good morning again. Each month, we share half of our Sunday offering with an organization in alignment with our values. This month, our shared offering is the Wesley Food Pantry, which aims to relieve food insecurity one family at a time. And we now have a way to give quickly and easily by text and credit card. And your donation today will be shared between the church and the Wesley Food Pantry. You can also still donate online or send a check after the service. The offering will now be received. Good morning. As is our tradition, each Sunday morning when we come together for Sunday service, we offer each other the opportunity to share our individual joys and sorrows. We share our joys so that our friends can help us to celebrate those memory moments in our lives. And we share our sorrows so that our friends can support us through those inevitable tough times that comes to each one of us from time to time. This morning, I, found I have five wonderful joys to share with you, and I'm going to read them in the order in which I received them. The first joy I received was from Dee Dee Marble, and she wrote, Last Sunday's service, July 5, brought such joy to my heart, so much talent, both in front of the camera and the many supporting from behind. It truly takes a village. Look what happens when you scratch a you, you. Woo, she wrote with a little explosive sign. Thank you, Dee Dee. A joy now from Jim and Sandy Hannum. They write, 
Jim and Sandy Hannum are delighted to have our daughter, Christy, and her wife, Miriam, visiting us from the Washington, D.C. area. And our grand dog, Pitu, is visiting too. Many blessings for a wonderful family gathering. Next, from Lara Wetzel, Lara wrote, I am so very grateful to the dear people who brought me meals that were so good. I thought I should be able to do it myself, but it quickly became apparent that I must not be on my feet that much. Thank you, thank you, she wrote. Many blessings, Laura, for your continued wellness. And now a joy from an anonymous sharer. They wrote, we were experiencing some hard times recently, and thankfully we found relief from UUCUC's Faithify Community Relief Fund and a food donation from the local township office initiated by the church. We want to offer thanks to the church and all who contributed to the fund. You've truly made a difference in our lives. Peace and blessings, everyone. And may the blessings of abundance continue to be bestowed upon you. And the last joy from Jefferson Westwood from Fredonia, New York. He writes, I will be visiting your church online this coming Sunday. My father, the Reverend Arnold F. Westwood, was minister of the Unitarian Church in Urbana from the late 1940s through 1958. I was born in Urbana, Champaign. I am spending my summer visiting all the churches where my father served. I enjoyed learning from his, about his service to your church on the history video on your website. I'm so grateful, Mr. Westwood, to have you join us today. Many, many welcomes. If you have a joy or a sorrow that you would like for me to read next week, then please send it to Joys and Sorrows at UUCUC.org. And please send it to arrive by 5 p.m. on Friday. Then I will read your joy or sorrow during Sunday service. And then it will appear in the following week's e news. And our e news is our weekly newsletter. So I'll be very happy to, to read those and we'll be very happy to print them and share your joys and sorrows with you. I ask you now to take a moment to share uh, a minute of contemplation, meditation, and or prayer. Many blessings to all. <music>
shine upon you. Our love surround you and the pure, pure life that's within you. God. How are we coping with COVID? February 26th was the first class of the Mindfulness Meditation Group being offered by the UUCUC Religious Education Program taught by Dr. Christopher Menard, a church member that heads up the Mindfulness Institute in the U of I Department of Psychology. We met in, th we met in person for three weeks at church before the lockdown, and on March 18th, we switched to Zoom. As we began to learn the unfolding news about COVID-19 and the restrictions inherent with anticipation of its spread, we were all befuddled with what was to come. How restricted are we going to be? Is there a test? Do I have it? Or will I get it? It was all very reminiscent of 1981, when my husband Tim and I were just getting together in our relationship, as we were hearing about the, quote, gay cancer which later became known as HTLV-3, and then later called HIV slash AIDS. We were scared to death that we were both infected, and starting a new relationship at that time was no picnic, especially when it was known that HIV was sexually transmitted. And then we began learning more about friends that were ill, and then deaths. I could do a whole hour or more just on that period, but it relates to how I slash we feel about this time frame. And at the time of this writing, we are a full 15 weeks into the COVID-19 isolation period. The timing of that mindfulness class was fortuitous, as the techniques taught in the class have helped both of us through this unprecedented situation in keeping our calm, but also doing a lot of reflecting on what activities of our lives do we savor and which parts had become more doing rather than being, thus being the most meaningful aspects. Gardening and landscape work has been a mainstay for both me and Tim. I've also been playing a lot more piano, an activity I allowed to go mostly dormant with too many other activities. On Thursday evenings, I play trombone with the Baroque and Old Music Ensemble organized through the Community Center for the Arts. It's not nearly as great as playing in the same rehearsal room, but it keeps my trombone skills, and more importantly, my chops in shape. So, with catching up on reading, films, and documentaries, especially those on PBS Passport, time with Tim, teaching him how to play chess, and digging out the backgammon board, another old favorite game that we'd not played for years. I'm also writing a family genealogy and history book, not to mention regular Zoom sessions with Tim's Temple Hansen cousins once a month, and the mindfulness meditation, either with a local online group or with pre-recorded audios. Add in taking a men's yoga course online, add some volunteer time with Uniting Pride, and thus our activities have actually become tilted way more in favor of those that we find fulfilling. Exactly what should happen in your retirement years so, I'm currently just fine with being an agoraphobic hermit, except for with very controlled groups of people with appropriate distancing and masks, and that includes Tim's 93-year-old mom. This time is a period not of what we can't do, but what we can do, an enforced sabbatical for someone that's never had one, having worked in the healthcare sector. Not everyone has it so good. We do remember that we have a whole lot of white privilege to be able to retire early from satisfying careers and have a regular source of income. 
For this reason, we feel good about supporting causes that assist others, especially those dealing with food insecurity, such as buying food each month for an immigrant family and supporting the Faithify campaign, among other organizations. The bottom line, if I have to stay at home with my husband for many more weeks, so be it. I almost died as a teen from suicide. I nearly drank myself to death until I was 25. My sobriety date is 39 years ago today, 1981. Same year we learned of AIDS, and had my behaviors continued, I'd be gone. Much unlike COVID-19, there were no tests for HIV until 1985, but not widely available. So with all the friends we lost to AIDS and then my brother to suicide, each year and day I see as a total gift. Whether I'm out and about raising a toast in a crowded bar, <laughs> I don't think so. Or enjoying a lovely home and multiple hobbies, yep, that's pretty doable. Again, Tim's mom is a 93-year-old that we are responsible for and responsible to her most awesome 24-hour caregivers. They're not through an agency and they for her care and feeding. We don't want to endanger her and we expect her employees to be appropriately careful and distanced. So we are doing the same. I fully trust and expect there to be a time for travel and life getting back to normal with group activities. But for now, we have a new normal, and we are actually enjoying it very much, primarily because each day is a total gift, whether we're hanging with large groups or we're distanced and masked. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Robison. Remember back in March when the guest minister encouraged us to develop a spiritual practice, even a pathetic one? Something we did repeatedly that allowed our minds to wander. We were invited to draw a multi-flamed chalice and write each of our spiritual practices in a flame. I could only feel one. Pathetic, yes. But I was walking every day. We were adjusting to the new work-from-home lifestyle, and my schedule was no longer my own to control. Now my activities had to be planned around my husband's conference calls and video chats and webinars. I walked to get out of the house. I walked to relieve my anxiety. I walked as a spiritual practice. And then the call went out for people to sew cloth face masks. And that became my new spiritual practice. Others might get bored I thrive on small, manageable, repetitive tasks. I enjoy solving the puzzle of how to lay out my pattern pieces to get the maximum use of the fabric. And I can, at times, spend a pay time paying attention to the fine details of customizing a mask for someone. But mostly, it's the time spent sewing piece after piece after piece. No decisions to make, time for the mind to wander, to wonder, to hold others' joys and sorrows in my heart, and to do more than just wish for healthy community. This next reflection is from my mom, Emmy Olmschneider. When I was planning this service, I was talking about it with her, and she really wanted to share her thoughts about the pandemic. So I will be reading her words. Greetings from Texas, y'all. My name is Emmy, and I am a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Midland, Midland, Texas, that is. I have attended your services virtually and in person as Kiri Fagan Olmschneider is my daughter. And as an aside, when our music director was in school, his first experience with Unitarian Universalism was through your church. So there is a connection. As part of this connection, I wanted to share with you the lessons that I have learned from this pandemic. As we are learning, the pandemic looks differently depending on where you live. Midland is in very conservative oil country, founded on both the ideas of individual rights and the necessity of people working together to survive the very harsh living conditions here on the Llano Estacado. 
And right now, I see a moving balance here between these opposing forces. I want to share with you what the pandemic has taught me, but first some background. Having lost my husband to a drunk driver in 2012, I've been practicing for this pandemic for a while. I know what it feels like to grieve for what is lost, and I know what sustains my life. Long before 2012, Rennie and I were in the process of developing native landscaping and learning to live sustainably. After his death, I focused on this goal, completing our native gardens, growing most of my own fruits and vegetables, and getting backyard chickens. Even before the pandemic, I would tell you that gardening and being outside, in nature, was my spiritual practice, connecting me to myself and the world around me. So, what was different then about the pandemic? I prefer to say that the pandemic gave me three gifts. Breath, time, and clarity. Three opportunities to reflect and to connect with the world. So, breath. Shortly after the COVID shutdown and the collapse of the oil industry here, I could see stars at night, something I have not seen since the 1980s, and the skies were dark with no flares. And the daytime skies were clear of oil field pallor. Even the din from people driving for the oil fields was gone. It was so quiet. I felt that I could breathe again and listen to the sounds of my garden, which I had not previously been able to do. Michael Pollan wrote, the gardener cultivates wildness, but he does so carefully and respectfully in full recognitions of its mystery. And there before me was the mystery and interconnectedness of life. And I realized at David Suzuki in the Sacred Balance writes, we are bound up inseparably with the past and the future by the spirit we share. Every breath is a sacrament, an affirmation of our connectedness with all other living things, a renewal of our link with our ancestors, and a contribution to generations yet to come. Our breath is part of life's breath, the ocean of air that envelops the earth. The second gift is that of time. Gardens are meditative places. Again, Michael Pollan. A garden should make you feel that you have entered privileged space. A place not just a set part, but reverent. But if you do not have the gift of time, it is sometimes hard to hear those reverberations that call to you. I think that intuitively gardens help one relax and unwind and lead you to contemplate and ponder new ideas. I know that my gardens here in West Texas have that. Sitting in my garden, I see, smell, or hear constant invitations for quiet reflection. Watching a butterfly unfurl his wings as he struggles in the transition from larvae to adult. The taste of the first spring green after a long brown winter. The smell of chocolate daisies as I escape the house once again for the serenity of the garden and the sound of bumblebees or hummers going about their daily routine. I know I'd miss these if not for the gift of time. And finally, clarity. When I am confronted by the stress of life, I prescribe myself garden therapy, a long period of time spent in contemplation and physical work. In my garden, there are no lawnmowers, no leaf blowers, no electrical tools. Just the sounds of the wind and the organisms moving all around me. There is a calming rhythm to garden chores, which focuses my attention and reveals details I might easily miss. Swallowtail eggs on the parsley and larvae of ladybugs, which look like miniature Gila monsters. I am surrounded by so much beauty that seems to spill out from one individual plant and then fills the whole garden. And then I see with great clarity what the Ogdens meant when they wrote in their book, Plant Driven Design. The single most essential element in any garden is not some particular object, plant, or tool. What's vital is a gardener who loves it. Unfortunately, much of what is promoted as or called a garden in North America is nothing more than a landscape installation. Love has nothing to do with it. Love, that is what is holding us all together in this time, apart or together, those freely giving the love they have and those receiving it. And in my garden, I see, feel, and know that we are all interconnected in ways that we may never uncover unless we have the time, the breath, and the clarity to do so. 
An excerpt from a poem by Mary Oliver. To live in this world. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, let it go. Thanks to everyone who shared their experiences with us this Sunday. Although we cannot be physically together, we are not alone. In that spirit, please join me for these words on your screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.